good morning, everybody. Uh, so just a quick announcement about the last assignment. It'll come out later this afternoon. Um, it'll be relatively short because you only have a week and a few days to do it. Um, you're not supposed to be doing work during the exam period, or you're not supposed to be doing classwork, sorry. You should be doing work during the exam period. You shouldn't be doing classwork during the exam period. Um, so uh, I'm a little uncomfortable giving you the full seven day, um, ex the full seven day accommodation. So it's probably only gonna be a three day accommodation. Um, so it'll be due, I guess, the Thursday night. Is that right? Tuesday, Wednesday? Yeah, Thursday night of next, not next week, but the week after. Um, so it's almost a full two weeks uh, you, that you'll have to do it. All right, so we're on to the um, final relationship between classes. Right? So we've talked about uh, dependency, association, aggregation, and composition. Um, and now finally, there's inheritance. So you've kind of seen inheritance already. You've seen elements of it already. Um, so you've seen that in a class, you can override methods like toString and equals, right? You've also seen that every object has a method toString and, uh, and has an equals method and a hash code method, right? Those are all related to the fact that um, uh, classes that you create in Java, they all inherit from some other class. You've also seen interfaces, right? So in an interface uh, declares what methods um, a class should provide. Uh, inheritance is similar. Um, or there's a similar sort of idea going on in inheritance. Um, if you have two classes related by inheritance, then uh, the one that inherits from the other class um, also gets the methods that belong to the other class. And we'll see that, uh, well, I'll, mention, I'll discuss that more in detail in just a moment. All right, so inheritance is a relationship between two classes uh, where we say one class is derived from the other class. It is the strongest form it's the strongest relationship that you can have between two classes in Java. All right, so this is a quote from the Java tutorial. Um, it says, the idea of inheritance is simple but powerful. When you want to create a new class and there's already a class that includes some of the code that you want, you can derive your new class from the existing class. In doing so, uh, in doing this, you can reuse the fields and methods of the existing class without having to write and debug them yourself. All right, and so this is suggesting that inheritance is a mechanism, is one mechanism for reusing code in Java, right? You've got a class that does something that you um, already want, right? But you want it to do perhaps in a, you want it to do either more things or you want it to do it uh, in a different way. You can use, it's possible that you can use inheritance to obtain the stuff that you want to do from the other class and then modify some of the other things that you want to change, right? When you uh, inherit, you don't, reproduce the code that's in the other class, right? You get it for more or less, uh, sorry, you get it without having to rewrite that code. Okay, so remember our object model, we have abstraction encapsulation modularity, right? The fourth uh, item of the object model, which we haven't talked about yet, is hierarchy, right? And so in the object model, um, sorry, in Java, hierarchy is represented or is yeah, represented using interfaces and inheritance. Right. Okay, so by hierarchy, I mean that your classes are related uh, in, an, a, in a hierarchical structure, right? There's some class at the top, which in Java is always object. Right? And then there's classes, I guess, um, at the bottom, right? And so what this picture here is trying to show you, this is not quite a UML class diagram. It's close, but it's not quite. Right. Uh, what, this, what this picture is showing you is that in Java, right, all classes uh, inherit from the class called object. Right? So, or we say every class in Java is a subclass of object. Right? So this is true in Java. It's not true in all object-oriented programming languages. Right? So a subclass uh, is a class that's derived from another class. Right? Now, um, You'll also see the terms derived class, extended class, and child class. They all mean the same thing um, in the context of object-oriented programming, right? They all mean subclass, right? So subclass is derived from another class, right? So if you were to draw the UML diagram that shows um, the inheritance relationship, right? You draw your two classes, so X and Y, right? You draw your a line connected by a open arrowhead right, to indicate inheritance. So we say here that Y inherits from X, or Y is a subclass of X, or Y is a derived class of X, uh, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, 
Now the superclass um, is the class from which a class is derived. So X is the superclass of Y. Right? It's important that you get the arrow going in the right direction, right? It points from the subclass to the superclass, right? Um, instead of superclass, you might see base class or parent class. Uh, they all mean the same thing, right? They all mean, uh, they're, they're all synonyms for the same thing. Uh, so here, in Java, uh, you've got the class object, right? And a string is a subclass of object, right? So we would draw the UML class diagram showing the relationship between string and object. You would draw a string, an object, and then uh, an arrow, an open-ended arrow connecting string to object. Right. Okay, so you can, um, a class can be derived from a class that's derived from another class, that's derived from another class, and so on, and so on, and so on, and so on. And so here we have object, right? X is derived from object, or X is the subclass of object, right? Z is derived from X, or Z is the subclass of X. And then A is derived from Z, uh, so A is a subclass of Z, right? So we say that a class is descended from all of the classes in the inheritance chain going back to object. So A is descended from Z, X, and object. Right? Z is descended from X and object. X is descended from object. Right? And so the classes uh, that a class are def uh, descends from, these are called the ancestor classes. Right? So object is the ancestor class of all other objects. Right? Uh, X and Z are the ancestor classes of A. Oh, you'll also see um, the terms parent and child. Oh, here they are, parent class and child class, right? And so you can sort of see that um, uh, the analogy that's made when talking about inheritance is the relationship between, I guess, family members, right? So uh, you have a parent, right? And then you have its child, right? Uh, you can extend the analogy here again. So object would be the grandparent of Z, right? I guess you could say it would be the grand-grandparent of A. But normally people just say it's uh, descended from, uh, to simplify things. Okay, so why use inheritance? Um, so there's, uh, uh, there's uh, several reasons why you might want to use inheritance. Uh, number one is that when you use inheritance, uh, you're saying something about the um, relationship of a class to another class, right? And so we'll get to that in a few slides, right? So here we know that X is descended from object, Right? There's uh, something else uh, that that implies, and we'll get to that in a minute. Yeah, we'll get to that in a minute. Right? Um, but the, uh, I guess the, um, one of the big features of inheritance that's normally taught to people who see it for the first, uh, to people who are learning object-oriented programming um, is inheritance is a mechanism for code reuse. Right? So a subclass inherits all of the non-private members. So those are the fields and methods from its superclass, right? So anything that's uh, public or protected um, is inherited by the subclasses. Constructors are never inherited, right? So that's the, um, uh, so in Java, that's the case, right? You never inherit a constructor. Uh, so that means when you make a subclass, you have to make your own constructors. So if you get to inherit everything that's, uh, everything that's not private in the superclass, Right. Uh, what that means is that um, if you can find a class that does that has some functionality that you want, right, you can derive a new class from the existing class and get all of that functionality for free. Right. Your new class or subclass gets direct access to all of the public and protected <laughs> fields and methods. Right. So if a superclass has a field X, then the subclass can use the name X to access that field directly. As long as it's uh, public, as long as the field is public or protected, right? You don't redeclare them, and you don't re-implement them. Uh, you don't re-implement the methods. Right? The subclass is allowed to add uh, new functionality and new data to the subclass, right? So you can add your own fields, and you can add your own methods, right? Again, right? I have to emphasize this because it, this is often happens. You don't repeat the fields or the methods that, you, know, you don't re repeat the fields um, that you inherit from the superclass. Right? Uh, if the superclass method does what you want it to do, then you don't repeat the method either. 
however, if the method, if you want to change the way a method behaves that you inherit, you can redefine or override um, the superclass method, right? And so that's what you do in to string equals in hash code, right? You're, um, you override the implementations that you inherit from the class object. Okay, so the second thing uh, that inheritance implies, uh, yeah, that inheritance implies is that inheritance models the is a relationship between classes. Right? And so is a means that a subclass is substitutable for any one of its ancestor classes. Right? So string is substitutable for big O object. Right? And what that means is that a string object can do anything that a big O object can do. Right? So big O object says it has an equals method. Right? It says it has a two string method. It says it has a hash code method. That means string also has a two string method, an equals method, and a hash code method. Okay, so remember that term is substitutable for because you're going to see it over and over and over again. Uh, so Java is, uh, the way that Java language is designed, it's designed such that object is unique, right? So it's the only class in Java that has no superclass, right? And furthermore, it's the class from which all other classes are descended from, right? And so that's what this picture was showing you back here, right? Uh, every class descends from object, right? Object has no parent class, right? So it's at the top of the, uh, of the Java class hierarchy. Uh, so when you make a new class, so when we made our point two class, for example, or our stack class or anything else, right? Um, if you don't explicitly state what the superclass is, then the, uh, then it's assumed that your superclass is object, right? So that's why we could just say public class point two, right? Instead of having to say public class point two, something, something, something about object, right? So if you don't say what your class inherits from, then it automatically inherits from object. So in Java, a superclass can have many subclasses, right? So back here again, right? So object has many subclasses, right? And people can add uh, other subclasses as well. So a class can have many subclasses, right? But in Java, each subclass has exactly one uh, superclass, right? So every child class has exactly one uh, parent class, right? So in Java, this is called single inheritance. So y inherits directly from x, right? The relation, there's no relationship going across, right? So there's no relationship between y and z, and there's no relationship between z and w, right? Uh, in this picture, y knows about x, right? Z knows about x, w knows about x, right? Y does not necessarily know about z, z does not necessarily know about w. And the other thing that you have to remember is that x knows nothing about Y, Z, or W, right? So this whole thing about parent and child relationships kind of breaks down at this point, right? Because obviously the parents know about the children. Uh, a human parent knows about its children, right? But in Java, a parent class knows nothing about its child classes, right? So the relationship here is strictly one way, right? It's from the child to the parent. Okay, so uh, you might think that this is a bit limiting in Java. Right, so you might think, well, hey, look, there's two classes. Class X does something that I want. Class Y does something that I want, right? Why can't I make a class that inherits from both X and Y? Right? So, for example, here, right? So why can't Z inherit from Y and W, right? <coughs> and so Java, uh, the designers of the Java language decided that they would not allow this to happen, right? And so, this, uh, so they decided that Java will only support single inheritance. Right. If you support what's called multiple inheritance, so a child class can have multiple superclasses, uh, then you run into this problem called the deadly diamond of death, uh, which is a real name. I didn't make it up. You can Google that term and you will uh, you'll find the Wikipedia page that describes this problem. Right. So this is a problem that you run into in object-oriented programming languages that support multiple inheritance. Right. So here we've got a class X. Right. X might have a method called F. And so that means y and w, they both inherit x's f method, right? So y and w, they're allowed to change how f behaves, 
right? So they can override the f method that they inherit from x, right? Now you've got z, right? So z inherits the f method from y, and it inherits the f method from w. And now you run into the problem of when you call f, which version of the method do you get, right? So if you have a z object and you call f, do you get the y's uh, version of f, or do you get w's version of f? Right? And so all, the, uh, all of the object-oriented programming languages that deal with multiple inheritance need some way to address this problem. Right? Uh, so the Java language designers decided that this problem was, uh, it was not worth the effort um, to deal with this issue. Right? Or, yeah, I'll just leave it at that. Right? So only single inheritance in Java, right? no multiple inheritance. Okay. So what does this is substitutable for uh, mean? Right. So this is really important. So this is the, I guess, I think this is the fundamental um, concept that you need to understand um, to, uh, when working in inheritance. Right. So is a, or is substitutable for, means right, I can use a, de a derived class object anywhere an, an, an ancestor class object is uh, needed. Right? So I can use a derived class object anywhere where an ancestor class object is needed. Right? So for example, if I have a method that takes in an object of type, sorry, it takes in a reference of type big O object. Right? So remember object is the parent class or is the super class of all other classes. Right? So when I call this method, I have to pass in a big O object reference. Right? Because everything inherits from big O object, Right? They are all substitutable for big O object. So I can pass in any reference to this method and it will work. Right? I can make a string and I can call sub method pass in the string. Right? That works because string is substitutable for object. Right? I can make a hash set. I can call sub method passing in the hash set as, a, as the argument. Right? That works because hash set is substitutable for object. Right? I can make a point to object, pass it to some method, and that works, right? Because point to is an object, right? Inside the method, some method, right? Anything that you do with OBJ, right, must be defined by the big uh, by the class big O object, right? So, for example, you could call to string or equals or hash code in here, and everything would work just fine, right? What you can't do is you cannot call a string method inside of some method, right? You can't call a hash set method inside here, and you cannot call a point to method inside of here, right? Because uh, your argument here has type big O object. All right, so you have to be a bit careful when you think about um, is a or is substitutable for, right? So it's very easy when you're programming uh, that you create a class that represents some concept. Uh, and it's easy to confuse the concept with the real world, right? So ISA has nothing to do with how things work in the real world, right? It has everything to do with how the programmer has decided uh, to model the inheritance hierarchy, right? So for example, right, the this is the, the classic example in object-oriented programming, right? Uh, is circle an ellipse? Right, so mathematically, uh, a circle is a type of ellipse, right? It's an ellipse where the semi-major and semi-minor axes are equal, right? And so if you were to think about inheritance in this way, right? In, uh, uh, sorry, if you were to think about inheritance in terms of how a mathematician thinks about circles and ellipses, right? You might choose to implement the circle class by inheriting from ellipse, right? And so there's a big question mark here, right? So mathematically, a circle is a kind of ellipse, right? But you have to remember that in inheritance, the circle must be able to do everything that the ellipse can do here, right? So now it depends on what methods are in ellipse, right? So if an ellipse can do something that a circle can't, right, then you should not implement circle by inheriting from ellipse. So remember, is a means I can substitute the derived class object anywhere uh, an ancestor class object is needed. 
right? So in this case, I should be able to pass a circle object to any method that uses an ellipse, right? If circle can't do something that ellipse can do, right, then that method that takes an ellipse is going to fail when you run it, right? So for example, inside ellipse, right, you might have a method called set size, right? So change the size of the ellipse, right? Changing its width to that, changing its height to that. Right? When you look at what the method promises it'll do, right, it promises it changes the width and height of the ellipse to the specified positive width and positive height. Right? So it guarantees what the method is implying that it always changes the width and height of the object right? to whatever the caller passes in, assuming that those values are positive. Right? So the contract for set size says that the width and height for of the shape will be changed. Right? What happens when you do that for a circle? So remember, anything that an ellipse can do, a circle must also be able to do, right? So circle will also have a set size method that takes in a width and height, right? It doesn't make sense to have a circle whose width is different than its height, right? And so suddenly, uh, the circle version of the method um, no longer satisfies uh, that, uh, no longer satisfies what the ellipse version of the method um, says it should do. So if you do change the si if you do call set size for a circle, right, and if you try to enforce uh, the contract in ellipse, right, you end up with a circle that has a different width and height. Doesn't make any sense, right? Okay. So what happens if there is no set size method, right? Then you might be able to have circle inherit from ellipse, right? But you still have to check. What do all the other methods do, right? If there's a method uh, in ellipse that a circle object can't satisfy, then you should not have circle inherit from ellipse. Right? Now, there's nothing in the language from stopping you uh, that stops you from in having circle inherit from ellipse, right? So this is, um, uh, this is something that the programmer has to be aware of, right? You have to be always looking out for is my derived class, can my derived class object do everything that the parent class object can do? Right, so let's look at a, uh, what looks to be a useful example of inheritance uh, to implement our stack data structure. Right, so remember, uh, so we just talked about stack in the past few lectures, so you should all know what the stack is, right? You saw that we uh, implemented the stack three different ways, right? So here's the fourth way. Right. Remember, a stack looks a lot like a list, right? So that's why when we implemented it the first time, we just created a list field and then called that field, uh, we, sorry, we implemented a stack using a list field and we stored the elements in the list, right? When we pushed an element on top of the stack, we just added an element to the end of the list, right? When you popped an element from the uh, top of the stack, we just removed the element from the end of the list, right? So you might think that we can have stack inherit from list, right? So when stack inherit from list, it gets an add and remove method, right? And you don't have to implement those methods yourself. Right? So let's make a stack of integers and we're gonna inherit from a array list integer, right? So it turns out this is really easy to do, right? So you make your class, so public class, I'm gonna call it bad stack because we shouldn't do it this way, right? We're gonna use inheritance, so now you use the keyword extends, right? So extends and now you list the superclass, right? So I would like bad stack to inherit from array list, right? It's a list of integers, so it's gonna inherit from array list integer, right? So you use the keyword extends, followed by the name of the class that you want to ex extend from. Right? All right, so now you just add in your methods. So here's push, right? Notice there's no fields. There's no field to hold the elements of the stack because a stack is a list, right? So our stack class inherits whatever storage the array list has built into it, right? So you don't have to declare any fields here yourself. There's not even a constructor here, right? And we'll get to that in a second, right? Okay, so push. So when you push an element onto the stack, right, you're adding to the end of the list, right? How do you add to the end of a list? Well, you just call add. <laughs> 
a stack is a list, so I can write this dot add, and then the value. Right? To pop an element from a stack, you remove the element from the end of the list. Right? Stack is a list, so it has a remove method. Right? So I can call remove and remove the last element from the list. Right? The last element has an index of size minus one. Right? Notice you get size for free as well too, right? because uh, a list has a size method. Right? So we get that one for free as well. And then return the element that's popped, and that's it, you're done. You, you can even print a stack. Right? If you print a stack, you get the array list version of string, which prints out square bracket, square bracket, and then the elements of the list. Right? You get equals, right? you get hash code, you get everything for free, it's amazing. Right? And you've implemented a stack in uh, five or six lines of code. Right? Awesome, that's it. So if you actually try it out, it works just fine. Right? Make a stack, push a zero, one, and two onto the stack, print the stack. It's amazing, right? You get zero, one, two. Right? Pop the stack and print the value, so it pops the two, pops the one, pops the zero. Right? If you wanted to, you could call a size, you could call is empty. The problem is, you can call any other list method as well. Right? So why should you not do this? Right? Because when you say that bad stack inherits from array list, you're saying a stack is a list. Right? A stack is not a list. Right? Con well, conceptually, a stack is not a list. Right? That means that anything a list can do, a stack can also do. Right? So for example, I can go into the middle of the stack and get an element from the middle of the stack. Right? Which you're not supposed to be able to do with a stack. Right? With a stack, you're supposed to be only able to access the top element. Right? You can change an element in the middle of the stack. You can remove an element from the middle of the stack. You can iterate over the elements of the stack. This one actually might be useful. Right? So the fact that you can iterate over a list means that you can now iterate over a bad stack, and that actually might be useful. So that one's not really a disadvantage. Right? The other three, though, are things that you are not supposed to be able to do with a stack. Right? So for example, I can make a stack. I can push some elements on the stack. Then I can get the second element from the stack right, by calling get. Right? I can change the second element from the stack. Right? And now your stack is no longer really a stack right? because you're able to access elements that are not the top element. Right? So using uh, inheritance to implement a stack is an example of the incorrect usage of inheritance. Notice, though, that there's nothing in the language that's stopping you from doing this. Right? So the proper use of inheritance uh, emphasizes the fact that uh, inheritance is, uh, means the is a relationship. Right? A stack is not a list. Right? You should not use inheritance to implement a stack. Right? Now, if all of this seems confusing to you, it should be. Right? Or, or unintuitive. It should be unintuitive. Right? Even very experienced programmers will get this wrong, right? So if you go and look in the Java standard library, right? This is the library that's distributed with every Java uh, implementation, right? You will find a stack class in java.util. That stack class inherits from uh, a class called vector, which was the old list in Java, right? So even the people who implemented the Java standard library screwed this up, right? Their stack is a list of some kind. And so if you use their stack class, you can fiddle with the elements in the middle of the stack. Right? So how should you do this instead? Well, you can use composition. Right? Uh, or you can roll your own implementation. Right? You can create a stack using an array or a linked set of nodes. Right? So remember with composition, that's a weaker relationship between classes than inheritance. Right? Using composition, you're saying stack has a list. Right? But that's very different from saying stack is a list. Right? When you use composition, you can't do things like fiddle with the elements in the middle of the stack. Right. OK, so this thing here, this is the, I mean, this would be one of the very obvious in, uh, uses of inheritance for pure code reuse. Right? List, array list does a bunch of stuff that I want. So if I inherit from array list, I get all of those features for free. Right? I get storage for the elements for free. Right? I get push for free. I get pop for free. Right? This, kind of this sort of looks like I get a constructor for free, but that's not because of inheritance. That's because of something else. Oop, oop. 
All right, so if you want to use inheritance for code reuse, you can. Right? You just have to make sure that when you're using inheritance, it really means is a, right, or is substitutable for. Okay, so remember we had that counter, right, from early in the course. Really simple class, right? It starts counting from zero, goes up to some value, uh, goes up to uh, integer max value, right, and then rolls around back to zero if you go past integer max value, right? So now you can ask the question, well, I want a counter, but I don't want to roll around at integer max value, I want to do something else. So here's our counter class, right? Remember, it has a private field called value, right? The constructor sets the value to zero. The value method returns this dot value, right? Advance tests if the value is integer max value. Uh, if it's not, add one to the value. If it is, wrap around to zero, right? So if I want to change the way that a counter behaves when it hits integer max value, I can use inheritance. So I'm going to inherit from the counter class to create a new class that does something else when you hit integer max value. Right, now we've got a few problems to solve. Right, the value is private. Right, so if I want to change the value of a counter, I can't access this field directly by name because it's private. Right, private means only counter can see this field. Right, the subclasses can't see this field. So I have to do something about that. Right, because our subclass will have no way to modify the value of the counter. Right? And so this is a very common problem when you decide to use inheritance uh, to, for code reuse. Right? It could be the case that the class that you're trying to inherit it from was never intended to be used in an inheritance hierarchy. Right? And so in this case, the field is private. Right? Okay, so you decide, well, all right, fine. Um, I have access to the source code for counter. I would like there to be different types of counters that behave uh, differently when you hit the maximum value. So we can go into the counter class and change the private field to protected. Right? So protected means uh, that subclasses are allowed to access a field or method by name, right? Where the field or method is defined in a super class. So if I change value to protected, any subclass of counter can now access value directly, right? They don't repeat the field value. Right? They get it for free, and they can access it. OK, I've got one more problem. <coughs> Here, if you go and look at the advance uh, method, it has a contract up here, right? It has something that it advertises advance should do, right? So the advance method says that if you hit integer max value, the value wraps around to zero. If I want a subclass to change the behavior of this method, right, then I have to change, or I should change the wording of the uh, documentation here, right? Because this method says it always wraps around to zero, right? So if you believed the documentation here, then whenever you call advance and hit integer max value, it should wrap around to zero, even if you're using a subclass object, right? Remember, a subclass is substitutable for its parent class. So if I don't change the documentation here, uh, that's going to confuse people who are using your new class. Right? So you make a few changes here. Right? So it says, uh, blah, blah, blah. if the method is called, when the value of the counter is equal to max value, then the value of this counter is set to zero. But subclasses might override this behavior. So when you use a class that is intentionally designed for an inheritance, you'll often see language of this sort. Um, either in the documentation uh, for the class or somewhere in the method of the class, right? It'll be documented as a comment. Right, so this, uh, this thing here now warn is now indicating to people that um, the value of the counter goes up, something's gonna happen when you hit integer max value. Okay, so now we can go ahead and extend the counter class, right? So I would like the counter to stop counting when it hits max value. Right? This is the behavior in a lot of video games where there's some integer counter, right? You might have some, you might have some, uh, so for example, you might have a score that caps at some, uh, that caps at some maximum value, right? You can't go beyond a certain score. So I'm gonna call it stopping counter. <coughs> 
right? We're going to extend the counter class, right? So stopping counter extends counter, right? I don't need any new fields. Right? I already have the value field in the counter class, right? So whatever you do, don't add a new field called value. So the, val the current value of a stopping counter object, right, it gets stored in the field that belongs to the super class. Right? There is no need for the stopping counter class to add a new field to store the current value. Furthermore, if you add a field that stores the current value for the stopping counter class, um, it becomes very easy to create a situation where the class no longer works correctly. Right? So you have to be very careful when you add, uh, that when you add a field to a subclass, you're not replicating functionality that you inherited from the superclass. You can add new fields, right? Those new fields are not visible to the superclass, right? Because again, relationship is a one-way, uh, sorry, inheritance is a one-way one way relationship, right? The parent knows nothing about the subclasses. Okay, so uh, I would like to add in a constructor for the stopping counter. Right, so I want the no argument stopping counter, uh, the no argument constructor for stopping counter. Right, it should set the current value of the counter to zero. So, what goes inside the constructor? All right, so now remember what a, the purpose of a constructor is for. Right, every constructor is supposed to initialize the value of its fields. Right, so how does a constructor set the value of the field that belongs to the superclass? Right, so remember. Stopping counter has no fields of its own, right? It's inheriting the fields from the superclass. Right? So the counter class has its own constructor that initializes the value field, right? So the child class, or the sorry, the subclass can call the superclass constructor, right, to set the value of the field, right? And this works even if the superclass field is private. So the way that you call the superclass constructor from within a subclass constructor is to write the keyword super, right? So this sort of looks like constructor chaining, right? But now you're chaining to a constructor in the superclass. So instead of writing this round bracket, round bracket, we write super round bracket, round bracket. That calls the counter classes no argument constructor, right? The counter classes no argument constructor sets the value to zero. Okay, so when you are implementing a constructor in a subclass, there's a bunch of rules that you need to remember. Right? Uh, and this is, so this is true for Java. I don't know if it's true for other object-oriented programming languages. Right? Number one, the first line in the body of every constructor must be a call to another constructor. Right? If the first line of your constructor is not a call to another constructor, then the compiler inserts a call to the superclass default constructor for you. If the superclass doesn't have a default constructor, or if it's private, then your code will fail, uh, your code will not compile, right? Okay, so number one, you must call a superclass constructor on the first line, you must call a constructor on the first line of your constructor. Rule number two, if you're going to call a, another constructor from within a constructor, it has to happen only on the first line, right? And finally, uh, sorry, three, right? Uh, if you have a class that's in an inheritance hierarchy, right, so if you have a subclass, then at some point you must call the superclass constructor, right, while you're initializing the object, right? You can call any superclass constructor, not just the no argument constructor, right? So. First line of your constructor must be a call to another constructor, right? When you call another constructor, it must be on the first line. And three, you have to call the superclass constructor from within a child class constructor, right? So on the first line, there has to be a call to another constructor, right? Two, if I'm gonna call another constructor, it has to be here. Three, I have to call a superclass constructor. So the only, uh, so the, if you just look at those rules uh, on their own, this is the correct implementation of this constructor. We'll come back to that in just a second. 
OK, so we can add another constructor that initializes the counter to some non-negative value. Right? So I have a stopping counter uh, constructor. I want to set the value of the counter to that. So what goes here? Well, I have to call some constructor. Right? OK, so you are still allowed to use constructor chaining in the subclass if you would like. Right? So if I wanted to call a stopping counter constructor, I still can. Right? So for example, uh, so in the no argument constructor, there's the no argument constructor, there's the uh, constructor that takes in the value. Right? So if I wanted to, I could implement the no argument constructor by chaining to the second constructor here. Right? So remember, to chain a constructor, you write this. Right? And then you pass in whatever argument the constructor needs. Right? So if I want to call that constructor, I have to pass in the value. This constructor should set the value of the counter to 0. So I can write this round bracket uh, 0, which calls this constructor. Right? Now remember, in a subclass, you have to call a superclass constructor at some point. So that's where the superclass constructor is being called. Right? This, super, uh, this call here calls the superclass constructor that takes in a value. Right? That, the superclass constructor, checks the value, makes sure it's greater than 0, or equal to 0, sorry, right? then sets this dot value to value. Right? So you can still chain. Right? So that's still a constructor call. Right? It happens on the first line of that constructor. When you uh, follow the chain, the superclass constructor is being called. So everything's fine here. All right. So there are a bunch of other ways you can implement this, uh, cons uh, these constructors. Right? So you can, uh, I'm just going to edit this slide. Oh, let me copy this slide and then we'll edit the copy. OK. So you can just write this dot value equals 0. That's fine too. Right? OK. So why does this work? Right? So remember the rule, remember, remember rule one, right? The first line of your constructor must be a call to another constructor. That's not a call to another constructor. Rule one also says, if that's not a call to the, if that's not a call to a constructor, then the no argument superclass constructor is called for you, right? So here you get super uh, round bracket round bracket for free, right? The, cons the compiler inserts that for you right there, right? That sets the value of the counter to zero, which means you can also implement this constructor like this. And that's also fine, right? Here, there is no call, right? The constructor body is empty. So the compiler silently inserts a call to the superclass no argument constructor, and everything's done for you. Right? What about this class? What about this one down here? Right? So here, you can also write this dot value equals value. Uh, sorry. Let me not do it that way. First, validate value. Then, this dot value. I just don't want to write the if statement right now. Right? This is also fine in this particular case. Right? So here we're in a constructor. First line is not a call to a cons uh, is not a call to another constructor. So the compiler sticks in a call to the superclass new argument constructor here for you. Right? So it writes super round bracket round bracket and sticks it in there for you. Right? So that satisfies rule. One, two, and three, right? Now you can go ahead and set this value to value, and that also works just fine. Right. Oops, sorry. Okay, so the question, the real question you should be asking is why on earth do you have to do all this, right? Because that looks like a, you have to do a, that looks like you have to remember a whole bunch of stuff, right? Uh, and so the reason you have to do this is because of the following, right? So what exactly is a subclass anyway? So a subclass, it looks like a new class, right? Uh, that resembles its superclass, right? So it has all the same public features that the superclass has, right? And then it might have some additional methods and fields that it adds on its own, right? So you might think that in inheritance, 
right? It just copies all of the public stuff from the superclass, right? Uh, but it doesn't exactly work that way in Java. So in Java, your subclass object actually contains a uh, parent class sub object, right? So inside the subclass object, there's actually an instance of the superclass, right? Now, what does that mean in Java, right? So remember in Java, if a class has a field or a sub object, right, of some other type, it has to construct or initialize that object. So the superclass subobject needs to be constructed, right? Just like any other field, right? It has to be it has to be initialized, right? The mechanism that performs the construction of the superclass uh, subobject, right? So what initializes the superclass subobject? Well, the superclass constructor, right? So why do you have to call the superclass constructor, right? Because stopping counter is a counter, right? That means it has a counter subobject. And that counter subobject needs to be constructed, right? That's why you have to call the superclass constructor, right? So when I make a, oops, that's messed up. That's backwards. Okay, so when I make a stopping counter object, the following happens. So new makes the object, right? It makes, sorry, it makes, uh, it allocates memory for the object, right? So somewhere you get a chunk of memory that can hold a stopping counter object, right? There's a call to the constructor. So that object's constructor starts to run, right? The very first thing that the stopping counter constructor uh, does, right? The first line is a call to the superclass constructor. Right? So the very first thing it does is it makes the counterpart of the stopping counter. Right? And now the counter constructor starts to run. Right? Now remember, counter inherits from object. Right? So the object part of the counter object gets created and initialized. Right? So the counter constructor has to call the object constructor. Right now, we don't normally do that on a explicitly, right? We just let the compiler take care of that, right? So the object constructor now starts to run. It does something, I have no idea what it does, right? But eventually it finishes. So now the object part of stopping counter has been uh, created, right? Now the counter object constructor is still running, right? So it makes the object part and then it keeps going. Right, so the rest of the counter constructor sets value, right? This dot value equals, uh, well, checks this dot value to make sure it's uh, greater than or equal to zero, then sets this dot value to one, right? So inside the counter object, right, value gets set to one, right? And now the counter constructor is done running, right? So the counter constructor, the counter part of the object is now created, right? If the stopping counter constructor does any more work, now it happens. Oops, sorry, right? But there's nothing left to do, so it's done, right? So notice the order in which your sub objects are built in, right? The object part of stopping counter gets constructed first, right? Then the counter part of stopping counter gets constructed second, right? And finally, the uh, rest of stopping counter gets uh, initialized third, right? So your objects get built from the inside out. Right, and so that's the reason why you need to call the superclass constructor on the first line, right? It's so that it can initialize the sub-object part of, of stopping counter. Right, okay, we're almost done. So we can finally finish off implementing stopping counter. All we have to do is change how advanced behaves, right? So you override the advanced method, right? Change the documentation or your contract of the method to indicate what happens when you hit integer max value, right? So now we stop, right? So if this max value is not integer max value, just add one, otherwise do nothing, right? And the counter stops at integer max value, right? And there is your uh, stopping counter uh, implemented using inheritance, right? So you can do this all over again, 
right? Suppose you want a counter that throws an exception when you hit max value, right? This is not a great idea, but we'll talk about this later on, possibly. Right? Okay, so make a class called throwing counter, right? It extends counter. Right? Again, you don't need any fields because the counter class has a field to store the value. Right? Put in a constructor. Right here, I'm going to call the superclass constructor explicitly. Right? Put in another constructor. Again, I'm going to call the superclass constructor explicitly. Right? Again, you can implement these two, uh, these two constructors many different ways, and they'll all be uh, legal. Right? Override advance. Right? This time, you say that it throws a runtime exception when you hit max value. Right? So if the value is not integer max value, add one. Right? Again, notice that you can access the value field directly by name because it's protected in the superclass. Right? If you do hit integer max value, you throw a runtime exception. Right? And there's your overridden uh, throwing counter class. Right? Okay, I guess that's all I want to say about simple inheritance today. Um, we're going to continue the discussion with inheritance because it's actually a fairly large topic next week.